fantastic today, sir. I just um I, I had to make sure my phone was muted because I I got a new ringtone, so it's a danger zone to as an ode to Archer. <laughs> That's awesome. Which gets some pretty funny looks from people. Dude, I totally called I, the fact that that was Archer's kid. I finally watched that episode. Yes. Yeah, very, very good. Very, very good episode of Archer. Uh, speaking of fantastic, uh, we have Heather on the line. Heather, can you hear us? I can. Oh, my God. It's working. <laughs> oh, this is brilliant. Um, so those of you that may not uh, understand, Heather is joining us from the SANS Defer curriculum. And uh, she's going to be talking about the Android versus iOS beatdown whenever it comes to data retention, which is uh, something I, I thought was very, very interesting when I, when I was talking with you about it. I think it was, where were we, Monterey? Yes. Yeah. So I'm going to just kind of hand it over to you and let you run. Paul, do you have any announcements for the people that are attending before we get started? Uh, I do not. Just check securityweekly.com forward slash webcasts uh, for future webcasts. We've got some uh, coming up with some of our uh, new sponsors and so forth. So Yeah, and uh, I think we those. even have one coming up from Eric Conrad and Seth Meisner of the SANS Institute as well. So we're really happy to have SANS as a sponsor and hanging out with us because SANS is, I, I think, the only sponsor that we have that actually just brings kick-ass content, and that's all that they ask is just to give presentations on really cool things. Also, as usual, this webcast is being recorded. After the red webcast is done, we will shoot out a link to everybody because you can totally trust links from us. So I'm going to go on mute, and I'm going to hand it over to Heather. Um, I, Heather, I don't have a bio for you, um, but I'll just kind of you know, quickly just kind of introduce you if you don't mind. Heather, uh, basically, for, for the longest time, was the core of all the mobile device uh, forensic stuff that we've been doing at the SANS Institute. All of the instructors, if we have any issues with our phones, um, uh, she's the one who helps us. So many times we're like, I have a problem with my phone. And she's like, stop surfing porn on your phone. And I say, my phone's not working correctly. And she'll say, you really, really need to stop surfing porn on your phone. So she's clearly an expert in this realm. So Heather, thank you very much for joining Security Weekly. And uh, take it away. Thank you. Um, one thing I want to mention before I even start is if you have questions, just type them in and I'll try to answer them as I go because I find it's easier to answer them on the topic that we're on instead of at the end. And Heather, um, I can one also, other thing I would like to mention. Heather, I can also sure. just ask the questions too as they come up. I'll just kind of be your question person then. Okay, that works. All Sounds right. good. On the note of questions, I know everyone is going to ask about malware. We are simply talking in this presentation about Android versus iOS and data retention. We will do malware talks, so if you're interested, let John and Paul know, and we can schedule something else specifically on that. That's always a hot topic with mobile devices. All right, so I am going to get started here. Can everyone see my slides okay? Can you see those, John? I'll assume that's a yes. Okay, so Android versus iOS, what we're actually going to cover today. So one, how each smartphone stores the application data. They do have similarities, but there's also differences. So I want to discuss how you'll determine um, where the data is on each and the best way to recover them and when to not trust your tool. How acquisition methods do matter. So obviously the way the data is extracted will affect how you can do your analysis. Forensic handling prior to the acquisition also matters. What this means is if you have a smartphone in your hands and you do not protect it properly, if the user or a remote person wipes the device, you're essentially SOL. So we will also discuss that here and there throughout the presentation. And then methods to de recover deleted application data. So if the user chose to delete it, if the application deleted it, if it was possibly wiped, how to recover it, and then how to recover all the data that's not parsed by your forensic tool, which a lot of people are blind to that concept that are new to mobile device forensics. They assume that if a tool like Celebrate says it's going to get application data, that it gets all application data. And I'm going to teach you in this presentation to hopefully understand why that's impossible. All right, so application storage. Where is the user data stored? By default, third-party apps and applications that come default on the smartphone on iOS and um, Android are stored in SQLite database files. The good thing about this, and this is a hidden gem for mobile forensics, is active SQLite database files contain deleted content. 
The issue is your tool does not always pull this data for you, so you have to know where to look. Um, in 585, the SANS course, we actually go through each of the important databases and tell you which tables matter, how the data is stored, how to convert the dates and times. So if you're interested in doing something like that, you should look into the course, or you can find this stuff online. Um, just a small promo, I'm writing a book right now, Practical Mobile Forensics, it will also be in there. So multiple resources for you to find it. Um, both iPhone and Android will store their standard contacts, call logs, SMS, calendar, notes in these SQLite database files. The forensic tools that everyone uses pulls this data very well, including deleted. So they actually go in and they know that in the SMS database file where to pull the deleted from. The issues arise when we start talking about third-party applications. So WhatsApp is a huge one. Facebook just purchased it. Now the tools are going through and saying, okay, we do a really good job at WhatsApp. We know how to get the contacts, the chats, um, any pictures or anything associated with it. But at the end of this presentation, I'll show you some of the applications where the tools are actually failing. So they're pulling some of the data, but not all of it. So our goal is to make you smarter. So make you realize what you're missing on your smartphone that is actually there that the tool is missing. So just remember, these database files are there. It is your job to dig deeper and find what the tool is missing. So iOS iPhones, iOS devices, um, when I say iOS, I mean everything from iPod Touch and later. So old iPods, think of those as an external device like a hard drive, not covering that here. So iOS devices use plist and SQLite databases to store the user content. Um, the application data is usually in a subfolder under the library um, file, which you can see here on the left. I'm looking, we're looking at Dropbox. That's what's actually highlighted here, and you can see asset hashes database file. So essentially, what you need to do, you're going to see up here, address book. In the address book SQLite database file, you can guarantee your tool is probably pulling most of the data from that. Um, you can always go through and look at it in hex and do a quick keyword search to verify. Same thing with calendar or calendar call history. Um, when you get into things like Dropbox and WhatsApp and Viber, data will be missed. So we're going to start digging deeper and showing you that here. But this is just an example of, on the left-hand side, you can see the file structure of an iOS device. And we're looking under the applications under the library folder. So Heather, Another location, sorry, go ahead. So is the reason why these tools aren't pulling this data is because they're kind of third-party applications. They're not as well known. There's a lot of, not a market reason for them to create a tool that will actually pull something like Asset Hashes Database. Is that predominantly the reason why? Because there's so many different apps that can run and they all have their different way of storing data? Or is there some kind of fundamental technological reason why they're not pulling that data? It's honestly, with speaking with all the vendors, it's just that there are too many. So how do they pick and choose which they believe the favorites are? because different people use different apps for different reasons. So they're trying to pull, they do market trending, and they'll pick the most popular downloaded ones, and they'll pull the data from that very well. But they may not pull it all. So um, at the end, I'm going to discuss um, WhatsApp and show you where the tools pull it from, but then they still miss just a little bit. And Honestly, the next version may come out and it'll be perfect and then I'll be proven wrong. And that's what I always make the joke of if I do third-party app parsing, the vendors are going to come and by the time I talk about it, it'll already be parsed by their tool. So it's just always catch up. There are so many apps out there that how do you pick and choose which ones you want to parse perfectly? And then when you throw Android in with open source and how everyone can manipulate it, it makes it even more difficult on these vendors. Oh, one more thing on iOS. So most of the data should be listed under the library, and that's commonly where the applications are stored, but you may also find application traces under documents, so make sure you look there as well. For Android, you can see we're looking um, at a file system dump here on the left, and SQLite databases are used as well as XML files. The XML files commonly store the preferences for the um, application data, it's good to examine these because you may actually see, if you have an application where you're required to register your location, you say yes. So it may track your lat long where you are, um, your email address for that account. Sometimes your password will be in plain text. So you want to make sure you're examining the XML files associated with each to make sure you're not missing that data. Um, 
again, depending where you are and your legal, um, how do I say this, your legal rights, just because you find a password on a smartphone doesn't mean you can just log in as that person. I've taught classes where people just want to log in as Hank, who is my alter ego, and often on the smartphones I use, you can't always log in as Hank. You have to have the rights to do so. Um, application files, you'll see here on the left, they all have their own subdirectories. So you can see um, on the left here, most of them are com, Android, something. Some just go Android. Um, some will say HTC Android. So each of these will have their own folder. And then within that folder, there's going to be a lot of subdirectories that I'll break down in the upcoming slides for you. So you can see what matters and what you should be tracking. All right, so now I'm going to go Android, and then we're going to branch into iPhone, and then we're going to come together at the end and talk about some similar third-party apps and how they both store them the same way. So here's this little Android fixing the iPhone there. I mentioned at the beginning that your acquisition method matters. So there are three different ways to get data from an Android device, logical, physical, and file system. So your logical. This is the easiest. It's plugging your phone in, essentially doing a backup. It's getting access to the phone data that the user can see. It, I shouldn't say it does not pull deleted data. Your tool is not going to pull deleted data and usually provide it to you. I'll talk about how to get the deleted data from a logical in three slides. Um, file system will acquire the SD card through the phone. So that's important to remember. Um, this will slow your process. So if you have a 32 gig SD card in an Android and you're trying to acquire that with an, a USB cable, it is going to be painfully slow. Um, we recommend that you acquire the SD card separately and then through the device, just so all the links are tied to one another with application data. And I'll also discuss that in the upcoming slides. Um, you'll get raw data files. What this means, all those raw SQLite database files you're going to have access to. So if something is not being pulled out properly or parsed, you can actually go in and manually parse that content yourself, which is fantastic. And then physical, your best bet, raw image file, bit by bit image, access to all the partitions, and you'll also get sections of analyzed data, which I'll show you here in the next slide. So physical acquisition, this is what it looks like on the right. Um, this is an older Droid Incredible, my own actual image here. And you can see the file system, this is the reconstructed file system. So this is Physical Analyzer by Celebrate on the right-hand side. And what it's doing is when it gets a raw binary image, it is trying to pull out the partitions for you to make your life easier. So it's saying, OK, I know that here's the user data partition, which is this first one. And then there's also these other partitions that I'm not sure about. It gives you two no-name partitions and then the system partition. The no-name partition, usually no-name underscore something, is the SD card. So that has been standard across the board. They have never called it SD card or external storage. So you're just going to have to go through and look at these partitions to see what is where and why. Um, if you have access to these partitions like you see here, it's like file system forensics. You can go in and you can carve. You can pull out all your deleted data, whether or not your tool parses it for you. So just remember, you always need to be smarter than your tool because there will be stuff that's missed. An example of your file system acquisition here. Earlier I mentioned that the SD card data would be pulled. You can see up here where it says external. Um, you'll see several folders underneath with the red X. That means those are deleted. And I'll talk about those in a second. What's below that, the HTC Android, the Droid Incredible, this is the same one. I just showed you all those partitions with the physical. This is what it looks like file system. You can see you still have access to the data folder, which is fantastic. Most of the user data is stored there. Um, it will analyze and decode data as possible. But again, you still have access to those raw data partition files. And you can still go in and manually carve them. One thing I want to point out of interest here. So I used to have a BlackBerry Storm 2 before I got my Android. And I had an SD card in it. When I bought my Droid, it came with a 2 gig SD card. So I wanted more storage. So I took the SD card from my BlackBerry, put it into my Android. My Android told me it was going to format that SD card. I said, fine, whatever, I don't care. So it says it formatted it. I used it for about a year, and then I acquired it. When I acquired it, I actually saw a BlackBerry folder, this DCIM folder, saved pictures, and Zedge. All these deleted folders here 
are from data that was on my BlackBerry Storm 2. So you how may much, hey, Heather, find yourself in a situation were, like this. How much data yes. were you actually able to pull out of those folders? Was it just pointers that there was folders there with those names? Or were you actually able to go in and actually view some of the data in those folders? You could actually view all of it, which was scary. So just the folders marked for deletion, all the content within it was still active. Okay, so until cool. it's overwritten, it's there. And I actually, I have used this in several examples because it surprised me to find all my old videos and BlackBerry photos and all my applications, ringtones, everything was there associated with my BlackBerry device. So you may find that in an investigation where you have an Android and maybe that SD card was in a camera and there's still data residing from that camera or computer or other phone. So you're going to have multiple devices in one. So this is kind of a great example of how cross-contamination of old data could end up on your desk. All right, so same device logically. This is where it gets pretty boring. Um, all the phone features that standard phones are built to do, you're going to get your contacts, call logs, SMS. If you're lucky, you'll get some application data. Usually what it pulls application-wise um, are the chats, or if they're texting back and forth, it may pull some text messages. Um, you'll get your, obviously, videos and pictures. And I have deleted data possible. The only way the deleted data is possible is if your tool pulls the raw databases. So if you use the Celebrate UFET, by default, it's going to give you access to the raw pictures and videos. It's not going to give you those raw database files. But if you use a tool like Microsystemation and XRY, they have this little category down below called unrecognized that most people don't even look at. If you go into that unrecognized, you can actually search for the raw database files and export them and look at them in any hex viewer and carve deleted data. So it really just depends on your tool and if it provides you the raw data files or if it doesn't. So logical is tricky. Deleted data is there if you get the raw files. All right, this is a very busy slide, but the main points here are um, this is how it's all laid out on an Android device. So this is where your data is stored. The data data partition has the most. You can see there everything from backups, um, local cache, miscellaneous files. That's where most of the user data is stored. Um, in here, there is going to be in the data partition, you will have a folder or a directory for each application that that user has installed. The cache is also going to obviously have application cache. So if the user opens something, it could still be stored in cache even if they deleted it from their data partition. So you always want to get the cache partitions. Um, you'll also find, if you want to know, did my user update this Android recently? You may also find traces of that in system and in cache because it's going to show over the air updates when they came through, if they were installed, if it was successful. So you'll be able to see what actually occurred on that device. The SD card. So whether it's internal or external SD card um, listed here, you're going to see you're going to have pictures on there. One thing of note, the ASEC and the secure ASEC, this is application data. And I'm going to show you an example um, coming up here where application data is stored both on the device and the SD card, and how if you separated the two, the data would no longer make sense. So you have to make sure if you have an SD card in a phone, you always keep that nearby and use that as part of your investigation because it gives you the total picture on an Android device. If you separate the two completely, you will lose the content and how it's supposed to be tied. John, they get access to these slides, right? So they'll have this one at the end. Yeah, they'll get access to the entire video stream. So everything you're showing, everyone will get an act, be able to see that. Okay, great. All right, so third-party apps. So specifically communication. People use these primarily because you don't need a data plan. I could tell you when I um, made data for these presentations I do, when I used um, devices to make most of the stuff with SANS course, I relied on Wi-Fi because I didn't need a data plan to use all these third-party apps to make calls, contacts, S SMS messages, everything you want to do, you can essentially do for free if you have Wi-Fi now on these smartphones. Um, if you're traveling internationally, I'm cheap, I don't get the prepaid SIM card, I use Wi-Fi, and then I pay $10 on Viber or Nimbus to call home. 
So it is possible and all that data is tracked on the device. Some of it is stored in the internal memory on the Android and some is stored on the SD card. Um, rhyme or reason on what is stored where, we don't always know it's application dependent. The user does not always get the option on where they want to store data. So if you download Facebook, for example, it's not going to ask you, do you want to store this on your SD card or on your internal memory? Facebook is going to do what it needs to do to function on that device. So you may find some traces on the SD card and a bulk of the data on the internal memory. When the data is stored in both locations, it's commonly not parsed by the tools. So that's one of the issues we find that it'll pull a little bit and then the examiner hopefully doesn't think that's everything because if that is true, you're missing a huge piece of the puzzle because most of this does require manual decoding. What I would strongly suggest is that if you have an application that is a big part of your investigation, that you actually take it a step further, look at what your tool is giving you, use a secondary tool to verify, and then go one step further and go into that raw database file and make sure that you're getting everything. And when I say database file, it could be files. And you'll see that in some examples coming up where the tool is looking at one database file and pulling everything correctly, active, deleted, doing a great job, but then it completely missed another location where the data is stored. All right, so how is this data stored when we're talking about applications on Android devices? So some of it is stored in the NAND flash memories. It is controlled by APIs and stored in the data data folder. Now in that data data folder, again, you're going to have an application folder that is going to store multiple components, which I'm going to show you in the next slide. It will also be stored externally on the SD card or on the internal multimedia card that's mounted on the Android device. Again, it can be stored anywhere there. So there's not just going to be an application folder. Um, you may have, actually, in your DCIM folder for your pictures, you may have pictures from Snapchat that are cached there. You may have pictures from Facebook that are cached there. So it's not just going to be a Facebook folder on your SD card. There may be multiple locations where you have to look. And that's where keyword searching really comes into play. If you know what you're looking for, you know usernames or user accounts, uh, locations, you know the application name, use all these in your benefit to drive your investigation. Most of the data, so depending on how you get your acquisition, if it's a file system or a physical, you're always going to see a forward slash MNT folder, that's your SD card. So you want to dive deeper into there and look for applications that make sense. So here we're looking at application storage on an Android and how it's actually stored. So each application is stored in the application folder. So you have the data data, and then you can see the application folder. So say we have com Android Katana or Facebook Katana, for example. That would be in the secondary later layer here under data data. Within that application folder, you're going to have library, files, cache, databases, and shared preferences. All of these will contain data that you can look at, but if you are only honing in on two, the two that are circled, the cache and the databases, matter the most. Um, this is where you want to go and examine for all the user data, all the user preferences, um, anything that was possibly open in that application will be stored in the cache, even if it's no longer in that database file. So sometimes I know Snapchat's tricky, and honestly, it depends on the device and the user settings on that device. Each model has changed, and the firmware versions change it. So, but if you're going to find, if you're looking at Snapchat, for example, yes. So, 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 so do you mean like Snapchat, yeah, like you mean between Android and Apple, it changes from those two main devices? Or do you mean even within the Android ecosystem, different Android devices, Snapchat will store its data in different locations? Even within Android, it stores it in different locations. So even within different, if someone's running 4.4 versus 4.2, it may store it differently. And also with the configuration when the user sets it up on what's saved, that can affect it as well. Now, is that so because... I can tell you... Oh, go ahead. Yeah, is that because Snapshot is pushing completely different executables for these different Android devices? Like they have one uh, for one version of Android and another executable for a different version of Android? Or is it like the difference between Samsung and LG and Motorola devices? I or, honestly oh. don't know the complete answer to that, but I think it's a little bit of both. I think it's and also factoring in the user settings. 
and what the user allows access to and how the data is actually being stored on that app on their device per that manufacturer. Thanks. So I know there's a really good paper from Champlain that a student wrote that um, talked about recovering Snapchat. And I tried to mimic some of those steps on similar devices running different versions and was not able to do the same thing. Because again, my exact Android device was not the same as theirs and then it gets manipulated. All right, so an example, Zedge, I know this is a cheesy application, but this was a good example that didn't have any offensive material in it that I can show you guys off my own device. Please do not make fun of some of my music files that you will see coming up. So Zedge application, um, the data on here was present on my Android flash memory as well as my SD card. Um, the hard part was determining which is relevant. Because this was my own device, it was pretty easy for me. Um, one thing to consider is why is the data stored in both locations? When I show you, hopefully you'll be able to see how the Android does this. So on the flash memory, there was a folder for net Zedge Android in the data partition. And then on the SD card in the MNT folder was Zedge um, in each. And what I found when I was actually going through and examining this, so if you look on the left-hand side, this is my internal memory. On the right hand side is my SD card. So when we look on the left, you can see in the databases file under, you can see the cache and then the databases. There are multiple database files in here. The journals also, to just to mention here, may store data that you should examine as well. When you see the folder that's second to the bottom or the file, the Zedge, those are usually .sqlite files. Make sure you're not using a tool that will only search for database files because nope. you will miss data that's stored in that .sqlite file. What is the difference between the DB and the DB journals? Um, the journals usually have some kind of log file tracking what's going on in the database. So in the journals we found some user information like log on dates and times, um, the last time it was used, some user names, some passwords. So the journals usually just track what's going on in that database file. Do you think of it as like a log? So examining here, you want to examine all these database files. And then on the SD card, when you look, you can see there's cache, ringtones, wallpapers. Um, Zedge, by default, is an application that I was using to have cheesy ringtones assigned to people when I was at that phase in my young life where that was really cool to do. Um, I had ringtones. I had wallpapers. You can see I had an Android versus Apple wallpaper. It's completely coincidental that that's what this talk is about. I just yeah. realized I had that there. Yes, but did you but did you have a uh, highway to the danger zone as a ringtone? Um, I actually you might see that. I think that may be one that's on there. It may be up. one that's on there. It may be one that's on there. You guys will get access to it, my ringtones coming if up. If not, we um, I can call Paul and we can get it. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. We can add that into the talk then. One thing to notice here that is interesting, if you look at the vCard file for Google HMaholic, that vCard file that's under the SD card there associated with Zedge, I never added my vCard information and deleted it. What I think is when the application asks you what it can have access to, it has to access your user information. So it reached out to your contacts and grabbed you as a user and then just marks it as deleted. Even though you're not telling it to delete it, the app is grabbing what it needs and then marking it for deletion because it no longer needs that information. At least that's what you hope it's doing. So this, uh. Yes, yes. You never know. You never know with these apps, you know, but we rely on them. So looking at the SD card a little deeper. So we, if you go back a slide, you can see the Android versus Apple. If you click on that, you can see it's Android eating the Apple. It's very bloody. This was the background of my Android device. So if you were trying to scan, if it mattered what the background setting of my device was, if I said, this is not my phone, and it's a background picture of me, not the Android eating the apple. It kind of proves that that could be my device or someone close to me that has me set as a background. You can see here in the database view, that picture was marked as a favorite. You can see I had 28 downloads. You can go through each of these and examine it. If you want to carve out deleted data, 
you have to switch from database view to hex view. So what, what and tools? In the raw hex is where you would search. What what tools? This is, is actually this is physical analyzer. Okay, thanks. So celebrate physical analyzer. And I like using physical analyzer for my physical exams just because it lets me switch back and forth between the raw database view and hex view. And I can bookmark and carve within a tool. So it's a good analytical platform. Even if it doesn't parse the data and you're looking at just raw file system, you still have those options. And again, it's up to your examiner preferences. What are you comfortable doing um, in bookmarking and how do you like handling your investigations? All right, so here are my embarrassing songs. Um, I don't see it listed there, but I do have American Hero. You might like that one, John. That's a good one. Um, it's a classic. Actually. So you can go through each of these. This is the SD card. And now what the data was doing was storing a table on the Android memory, linking to all the actual files that it downloaded, which were stored on the SD card. So everything listed in the tables was on the internal memory. All the actual files themselves, including the pictures, the ringtones, everything I opened in that application were stored on the SD card. So if you got rid of that SD card and it was no longer a part, you would only have the file names. You would essentially not be able to link it to the actual file itself. So that's why you really need both. And then once you click on any of these, so here I'm clicking on American Hero MP3, you can see the file info. Um, the last time I accessed it, when I downloaded it, you can see all the data. Um, this may be really important for pictures that were taken. Um, location information where that picture was taken, if you have a missing persons case, depending on what your investigation is, just remember to always look at the file information. You can export these and put them into any EXIF viewer or any tool of your choice. You can throw them in NCASE, FTK, whatever you want. And that's another thing to note. If you have a physical acquisition, you can always export it and put it into your forensic tool of choice, something you're comfortable in, and doing your examination there because most of these smartphone forensic tools let you run one keyword at a time, which I know most forensic examiners do not like doing. So it makes sense to dump it out and validate it in something else. So I got a question, and, and I think this is probably a burning question for the slide. Do you really have the theme song for 90210 on your phone? <laughs> I did. This is an old phone. This is a Droid Incredible, okay? Old. All right. So, so, so by old, you still mean a decade after that show was on the air? Yes. Good to hey, know. I just, also, ha I also have Michael we Jackson on here. We don't judge. Uh, we're just checking in, making sure. <laughs> you have to keep the slide interesting, right? I put that on here just for this slide, just to entertain you guys. Right. I'm a wizard with Photoshop. <laughs> Okay, so I'm gonna move into iOS now. So I'm gonna do the same thing for iOS that I just did for Android, and I'm gonna bring it all together with applications that they have in similar and data that's missed by the tools commonly. So iOS application storage, same thing, logical file system physical. Um, logical, and I know that the vendors sometimes get annoyed at me for saying this, but you know what? We like to be honest on these webcasts. They're doing a backup file. They are doing an iTunes backup file. That's what you're getting. Anything that iTunes does for free, that's what your tool is giving to you. Some of them say that they can get through a lock device, and they can do that if they have access to your Mac computer or your Windows computer and get the escrow keys. If you're interested in learning more about escrow keys and how to do that, you can follow your tool. You can do research, or you can take... Um, the class that I'm writing with Sarah Edwards, Mac 518, Macintosh Forensics. Sarah will cover a lot of escrow keys and how to do everything on a Mac. So if you're interested in that, that's a small plug for her course. It's doing well already. It's had one beta and a new one's coming up. Um, the file system, essentially the same thing. It's using iTunes. So the Apple file connection, the lockdown service, and the backup services, these are the three segments that iTunes requires to back up your device. So it's essentially doing an iTunes backup and then normalizing the file system to give you access to the raw files. So if you look at an iPhone backup, it's not pleasant. You're going to have a few files that you can look at plist wise and the rest are not going to make sense. You need a tool to step in and normalize that for you um, or some kind of script. And that's what the file system is doing for you. And then the physical, um, it's a raw image. One thing I don't want anyone to get confused of, it's not bit by bit. So with physical acquisition on iDevices, 
it's only providing you what it can decrypt. So if it can physically acquire 15 gigabytes, but it can only decrypt eight, your raw image is only going to be eight gigabytes. It's not even going to give you access to the files that cannot be decrypted. And that's with any tool by default. Um, if you get a raw image, so say you use John Zdarsky's method and you use scripts and you get a raw physical image and it's a 32 gigabyte, that's fine, but you won't be able to do anything with that until it's decrypted anyway. When you decrypt that image, it could become 20 gigabytes because that's all that it could decrypt. So all the tools are doing this. There's nothing sneaky about it. If you read up on it, they're all telling you, hey, this is what we're doing. You can't manually decrypt those ones anyway, so they're just pulling out and giving you the data that they can. But again, this is the most information you can get. Um, you cannot physically acquire an iPhone 4S and above anything later, even if it's unlocked. It's just not physically possible. Um, when the new chips came out on those devices, security got locked down. We do not have an exploit to be able to get into it. So you cannot physically acquire those um, unless they're jailbroken. So, so when question. you see tools like Elcomsoft or Oxygen, yes. So question about that. Are there a lot of things in forensic still with mobile devices where you need a jailbreak or an exploit to actually do forensics? And if you do, how does that actually imp impact the investigation? Um, there are still several. So like with Android and iOS on most of them to get physical acquisition, you have to root or jailbreak. Um, the only way around it, so if you're doing open source methods, you're pretty much guaranteed that you have to root or jailbreak the device. If you are using the forensic tools, some of them on Android will go and say, hey, I'm going to root this device for you, and then I'm going to unroot it, which should always be tested to make sure that's true. Um, most of the forensic tools on iOS do not jailbreak anymore. They just use the exploit and inject the bootloader. So before the device is even booted up, they're putting their bootloader on the phone and then pulling it off. Um, if something fails, you could brick the device. I have not bricked a device since an iPhone 3, so the tools have gotten better. We have always tested it, and I can tell you now that most people trust the tools because they have gotten very, very good at it. If it's anything open source, obviously you definitely want to test it and make sure you validate that it works on your own and what has changed. Um, I have not changed user data from doing these jailbreaks or roots, but I'm not saying it can't happen. Because if something goes wrong or the phone has issues and gets caught in a recovery loop that you can't get it out of, you obviously have ruined evidence in that situation. So it is possible to ruin it, but yes, you do need some kind of injection to get into the bootloader, to inject the bootloader, or root access to the device to get physical acquisition on most of, the, most of these. And if you can't do that and the device is unlocked, then just do a logical acquisition and go with what you can and hope you have access to the raw files because deleted data is still there and you should still be able to pull some of it out. And also on that note, um, if you can't, so I was actually doing edits for 518 the other night for Sarah and I did a backup of my iPhone 5S, which you cannot physically acquire, and then I was looking at it in iExplorer and iBackupBot, which are two free tools, and I was appalled at the amount of data that was stored in it. I chose to backup my applications, and in my Facebook application, which it claims it can't even pull data from, it was able to show me my Twitter login, my Instagram login, my Facebook login, and the password for my Instagram, all in plain text. So, so it will pull data that will shock you. So there's good stuff out there, even if you can only use open source tools and do logical acquisition. It's always worth a shot. Don't give up. Get what you can from these devices in any way possible. So if you can get physical acquisition, so iPhone 4 and below, and that's the example I'm showing here. You can see an iPhone 4 CDMA device. This is, again, physical analyzer on the right. It's going to reconstruct the file system, give you access to the raw petitions, um, recover deleted data where possible. It will decrypt data on email messages and passwords only if you know the password. So if you choose to physically acquire a device that you do not know the password and the tool cannot crack, it will still acquire it, but it will not be able to decrypt email or passwords. And what I mean by passwords are if you have a Gmail password, your Wi-Fi password, any accounts, user accounts that it can, it's going to try to grab all that data from the key bags 
and put that into one nice database file for you. So you can say, okay, here's Heather's Gmail password, her Wi-Fi password, her Facebook password, and it'll go through. Some of them, it won't be able to decode, so it's just gonna look like nonsensical data in that table, but it's trying to give you what it can. Again, no access to encrypted, unallocated space. So you're not going to actually be able to carve an allocated space because it's not going to be there. It's not going to give you access to it. And you can see here, you'll have the data partition, the system partition, and then you can break down in the file system what's actually there. Your file system data on what's achieved. So here's an iPhone 4S. You can do file system dumps on the 4S, the 5S, the 5C, because it's essentially a backup. So if you look here in the file system, it's showing you the AFC service. You'll see all these iTunes control. That's what iTunes needs in order to make that backup file function. The backup service does give you access to the VAR folder. And in that is the mobile folder, which has a ton of data that you actually need to examine. The lockdown service folder, that matters if you need to say, is the device jailbroken or not? Your tool usually does this for you, but if not, you can go into lockdown service and there will be a flag saying, is it read only or is it read write? And you just check that flag and say, okay, this is jailbroken, it's not jailbroken. Most of the tools do that for you now, even the free tools. So they're gonna be able to go check that status flag for you. Oh, one thing here too, previously encrypted backups cause issues. So if the user used iTunes and selected encrypt backup file, there's a rule. Once encrypted, always encrypted. Once they choose to encrypt it, that key is stored on the device. So if that device is ever plugged into another computer, it remembers that it was encrypted one time, and you actually have to enter that passcode to back it up again. If you don't know that passcode, it will create an encrypted backup. If that happens to you, you can use a tool that costs, I think, $120, Elkomsoft Phone Password Breaker. It does a really good job at cracking these encrypted backup files. If the user uses a four digit PIN, which some people I know will use that same four digit PIN across the board. So if their PIN is 9896, they're going to use 9896 on their backup and just stick with it. If they use capitals and lower cases, you better have a dictionary file because otherwise it's probably not gonna crack it. It will just keep running because by default it will run all lowercase or all uppercase. It's not going to mix them in a combination. So you're gonna have to create some kind of dictionary or throw dictionary files against it to actually get that brute force to function. One way to know is you can download a demo, and if it can crack it, it'll show you the first two digits and then put stars after until you buy it, and then at least you know that it will work on your device, and then you can purchase it and save your money if it's not going to work. And then here's the same device, um, logical backup data. You can see it got a lot of data. So this is a logical acquisition. So even if physical is not supported, you don't have the tools or the money to afford these fancy tools that can do file system dumps, a logical acquisition will get a lot of data. And you can see that here. The issue is, again, for deleted data to be possible, you have to have access to those raw database files. So if a tool is simply giving you what you see here and just the parse data, so great, we have 3,421 cookies. Where is the database file for Safari that's storing that? That's what you really need to get access to. And if you can't, then this is all you're left with. So you so want to try to find a tool that will actually give you access to those raw databases. So would you use this as kind of a roadmap on different things to then go look at further? This gives you an idea, hey, this is some data here, but now you actually got to pull the full databases to get the complete story. Yes, it's like I paid you to say that, John. Um, so yes, your logical acquisition, even if you get physical, you should always get a logical as well because it's going to give you your pointers to dive deeper into your physical. So worst case scenario is you get a physical dump. Um, say you even had to do JTAG or chip off on an Android and you get this physical dump and now you have no idea what to do because none of the data structures are normalized. It's just raw hex. You could actually look at a logical dump and say, okay, I see John in a contact. Now I'm gonna search for the name John and I'm gonna search for his phone number. And then all the instances of John will show up and that may tie you to Facebook. Then you see John's email address. That's gonna tie you to email. It may tie you to WhatsApp. So use this essentially as your cheat sheet to dive deeper in your physical and file system and your raw files. So if you're looking at just the SMS or the notes database file, you can say, okay, there's 10 active notes. If you go into that database file and look at it in hex you and you see 20 instances, chances are 
10 of those may be deleted. So you can look at what the active ones are and then carve out the deleted. Excellent question, John. Okay, so how is this data stored on these iOS devices? Um, HFS plus file system, essentially, um, everyone keeps saying that iOS and OS X will eventually become one, and it's been a rumor for a while, maybe it will, don't know. There's no external storage, so all the data is stored internally in SQLite databases and property lists. Most of the property list files, just like Android had the XMLs with the preferences, the property list will usually store the preferences. So if the user, whatever they give that app permissions to should be listed here. So if they download, um, say they download Angry Birds and it wants to say, okay, can I have your contacts? Because I want to spam these people and say, hey, you should play Angry Birds too. If the user says no, it's going to list that stuff. Did they give it permission? Yes or no for location. Yes or no to access their pictures. So all that stuff should be listed in the property list. Um, network storage, one thing to consider here, application data could be stored in iCloud. You can use tools like Elkomsoft, that same password phone breaker, will pull data from iCloud backups. Um, some of the tools like Physical Analyzer may have issues parsing those, depending on if they have to actually pull it from the cloud or if you pulled it down already and you have access to it. And then another thing to consider, applications that use network storage. So if they're using Dropbox, are they using it as an application on the device or are they using Safari to go out and log into Dropbox and how do you get access to that data? So there are multiple um, balls that you're juggling here when thinking of how this application data is stored on these iOS devices. The partitions, um, data partition is primarily where all your data is going to be stored in the mobile folder. Um, in that mobile folder, the things you have to consider here are your applications, your library, and your media. And I'm going to cover that in an upcoming slide for you to break it down even more. In the system partition, this is where essentially your updates occur and the iOS bootloaders are stored. Most people don't look at the system partition unless they have to say whether or not the device is jailbroken. If the device is jailbroken, there may be more interesting data in the system partition. Other than that, it's pretty standard and you want to focus on the data partition because that's where everything is going to be stored. Just like the busy slide for Android, I'm giving you one here. Um, your evidentiary locations, your media folder. Um, I don't want to insult anyone, but I've had people ask. There are not SD cards in an iPhone ever. So your media folder is in the internal memory. So both the media and the library are in the internal memory. And this just breaks out all the locations that you may actually need to look and the files in each that should matter to you. So this is kind of like a little cheat sheet. And we are trying to come up, we're in the process now of doing a poster for 585 that hopefully would help you even more on where to look if you're working a smartphone. Uh, but these little cheat sheets here hopefully will guide you. And obviously it's a very busy slide, but there are a lot of locations to look on these smart devices. So third-party apps. This slide is exactly the same as Android. This is where they are the same. They function the same. People use them for the same reason, so I'm not going to speak any more on this. I'm actually just going to go straight into one. Um, recovering the data in your private var mobile application folder, each application is stored in its own folder like before. Unlike Android, that would call it com Android Facebook, this doesn't do it so easily. So if you have physical acquisition, the application identifier is a random string of characters. So it may say like EEFF22, and you're like, oh, that's Facebook. I'm just kidding. You will not know that that is Facebook. You may, and you may get used to that. But there are a random string of characters. I'm going to show you in the tool how to narrow down which one belongs to which. But an easy way to do it is click once, let the folders expand, and you'll see something that will say Instagram or Facebook or Viber. You should see that in there. Um, the actual application is stored within that folder. So if you expand it, you'll be able to see it. If you did a keyword search, it would take you to that random string of characters folder, and then you could just dive deeper into it and actually look in the database files. So application storage, again, there's an application folder within the mobile applications directory. Um, documents, library, application code, and attempt folder. All of the applications should have these folders, but they're not required to. 
So if you see an application that's missing possibly the temp folder and documents, it doesn't mean that something's wrong with it. It's just not required to have those. Often, some of these folders are empty. The application code and documents folder are usually what the app needs to function. Um, the library folder is going to show the traces of user activity. So in this folder is where you're going to find the cache data, the cookies, any preferences. Um, so you would have plist files in this library. You're going to find database files in the library, and that's where you actually have to dive and examine each. So circled here, remember, library. All right, so now we're going to look at Facebook as an example in this one. So the Facebook application, um, the following areas must be examined, the caches, the cookies, and the preferences, depending on the device. So when a new version of iOS comes out, this may change. You should always look at these three, but there may be additional locations to look. So I'm teaching you here, look here, but be smart and remember to look at surrounding files if they seem relevant. All right, so here is what I was talking about. This FEE2BA8A6, and I'm not going to read the rest to you, that is the application identifier for Facebook on this device. Um, from what I was told in the phones I looked at, that is standard, so this FEE2 is Facebook. Um, I have not found one yet that it hasn't been that, but then again, I don't have hundreds of devices to look at and verify. I have four, which I do my comparisons on. So when we look at the library folder, you can see you have application support, caches, cookies, and preferences. In this last slide, I should, told you caches, cookies, and preferences. That does not mean you shouldn't just take a glance at the application support for relevance, because you never know what's going to be in there that may make or break your investigation. Again, be smarter than your tool. So as we expand here and we go into the databases, we are now digging deeper, and we're in the FB store under caches, and you can see here we're actually looking at the store.sqlite file, and you can't really tell it's highlighted, but it's that top one there, and you can see the name. So what we see here is Gus Thomas. That is actually the profile name assigned to the Facebook account. You can see here there are tons of tables to go through. Um, the goal of 585 and some other things I've written is to try to narrow this down for you so you don't sit here like I did and go through every single table trying to figure out what matters and why. So we're trying to help you out with doing that and telling you exactly look in the store SQLite and look at name, that's your profile. As you continue, when you go into preferences. So here, this plist file, um, 102-538-1141 session plist, this says Carabas in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Um, not my favorite location, but I was there. And what this is is actually a check-in. So I actually checked in that I was at Carabas on Facebook, and it was stored here in a plist file. So this is the perfect scenario where if you only use a tool that looked at database files, which there are some out there, and I'm not saying there's anything wrong with it, you just have to know how to use the tool. So Oxygen Forensics is an example. You could dump all your third-party apps from Android and iOS into that folder or into that tool, if you do not select to look at .sqlite, .db, and plist, you would have missed this information. So you just have to make sure you know how to use your tool. So a question on that, uh, that check-in information, is that temporary? Does that time out over time? Or is it pretty much sticky? Once it's there, it's there. Um, so I have found that it's pretty sticky and it stays for a while. I can't say what happens if you delete the app and restore it if that stays there or not, but you'll find several um, session plists sometimes with different numbers on when they occurred in these folders. And if you actually scrolled down in the raw hex here, you would see other check-ins that I have done to at completely random times. But it's not just temporary and it's not just overwritten frequently. It seems to be sticky for a set amount of time and I don't know what that set amount of time actually is. So the FB Sync Store database file, um, this one is one that is commonly missed for Facebook. Um, if this is pulled out, this is when it'll show you all your friends, um, the people that you've searched for. So if you are a Facebook stalker and you type a lot of people's names in, it's going to cache those, unfortunately, and people are going to see all the people you're stalking. Um, all 
the table that lists people, these are actually all your friends. So even if South Riding Inn, um, one thing that's odd is South Riding Inn is not my friend. I could tell you that I think I had a friend that checked in at South Riding Inn and I clicked the like button and it associated that to people on my account. Same thing with Backyard Gr Grill Chantilly. I have no idea what that is or where that is. So I guarantee someone was there and I clicked on it that I liked it and then it kind of cached it on my device. So make sure if you were saying Heather committed a crime at the Backyard Grill Chantilly and it's here in her people, make sure you can prove how that actually got there because I can tell you without a doubt, I have no idea who Backyard Gr Grill Chantilly or Ryan Cage is and those people are listed in my contacts. Um, you'll find, so when I was creating the material for 585, I was Skyping myself because I'm lame and I needed a Skype database communication going on. So I typed in my Skype name is HNMDC. I typed in HNM and on that Android device that I was using, if you look at the contacts, there are 300 deleted contacts for HNM dash something else because what it did, it cached it and it cached it right away as my contacts and then showed it as deleted. Even though I have no idea who these people are, I never communicated with them, I never saved them to my device. So your phones are being smart and trying to help you by caching this stuff and staying fast. That's how they're smartphones and they're quick. But it also can hurt your forensic examination if you don't understand how that data got there. So it's very important to understand the file system layout, how the data is stored, and why this information is where it is. Because otherwise, you would look at all these contacts and say, these are people that Heather is friends with on Facebook. Earlier, John mentioned, could you use the logical to dive deeper? Here's another way to dive deeper in your application. So first steps, you have a smartphone dump. You're looking here. We're looking at an iPad one. So what to do first? In the Analyze Data section, which is down here, this is Physical Analyzer. Again, you can see there's chat. So you can see iMessage, SMS. Um, you can actually go down and look. You can say, OK, there's installed apps. Great, I'm going to click on that. So you click on installed apps, and you can start seeing things here. And you see Facebook, Haywire, um, standard other ones that are there. So if you want to see Facebook, if you look over here to the right, you're going to see the application ID. And here it's showing you it's FEE2, that same folder we were looking at. It's going to show you the location where it's stored. That should point you to the next spot. So from there, you're like, it's saying, okay, it's on Com Facebook. You can then go into the data files application and it's going to show you again. These are only, so if you go back to installed applications, the contacts calendar, anything that iOS installs by default will be listed here. So it's pretty overwhelming. If you go into data files applications, this is what the user installed. So Words with Friends, Haywire, Tango, Twitter, Facebook. It also shows you the location. So your next step should be to dive up into the file system and dig down into those folders because it's telling you where it is. This is making your cheat sheet for you. It's saying, look here. It is your job to then go and look there. So like if you go straight to um, this next slide here, database files is another one you can look at. And there's 127 listed here. So you could go down, you could find that FB sync store. If you didn't know that FB Sync Store DB was associated with Facebook, you would miss this. If you're looking at Tango, if you didn't know that TC.DB is the Tango chat database, you would miss that. If you didn't know that Words with Friends is chess.sqlite, you would miss that. So make sure you're not just going to these databases. I know that some vendor training says, go ahead and just look at the database files because you may not know what it's associated with. It's just giving you access to the raw database. So you actually have to go up into the file system and dig into each of those applications to verify it. You may also find that on some of these versions of the phones, um, what may be visible in plain text on one device seems to be encrypted on another. Make sure it's not just encoded. So some of them, if um, the TC database file, for example, for Tango and some of the Viber database files, um, I believe Viber is sgiggle.db. They seem like they are encrypted when you look at it, but it's actually just base64 encoding. So you can download a free base64 decoder, copy and paste those messages in it, and it will actually decode them for you. So don't stop if something seems like it's nonsensical data. It may just be base64 encoding, and you may just have to take one extra step to get all that information. And again, 
all these database files can be exported and used in any tool of your choice. So you don't have to stay just in physical analyzer or oxygen or x-ray or IEF. You can get rid of all of them and take them out and look at it on your own. Okay, so some social networking. Um, just to close this up. So common ones that we see, Viber, Tango, WhatsApp, Nimba is Haywire. Um, the chatting ones, Snapchat, FaceTime, and Skype. One thing that's hard with FaceTime is if someone starts a phone call as a phone call and then switches it to FaceTime, the status flags get really fuzzy on saying that that actually occurred. So if that's ever a part of your investigation, I, I wish you the best of luck on determining if that truly happened or not. Um, if it starts as FaceTime, it's pretty cut and dried when you look at the status flags that that's what it was. Um, social networking sites and the less apparent chat applications, these are the ones that get tricky. So like Words with Friends, if you didn't know that people chat within it and you didn't know that that's called the chess.sqlite database file, you may have some issues. Um, what I would suggest is if you find an application that is relevant to your investigation, research it and know the ins and outs on every single thing it can do so you do not miss data. So here's an example where data can be missed for WhatsApp. Um, this is Physical Analyzer. It's doing a great job. It looks beautiful. It's given us the entire conversation. It's listing it under chat. So you can see under chats here, it's listed deleted, deleted iMessages, active iMessages, Viber, WhatsApp. So great, we have some chats. Where is it actually pulling this data from? So when we go and we look deeper, you can see the chat storage SQLite. These are all the chats. And you can see it's pulling it from Leroy, the WhatsApp associated ID. What it's missing, the contacts that SQLite. So what Physical Analyzer was doing is going through and saying, okay, great, I have all these chats, so it accessed this database file, the chat SQLite, but it completely skipped one. There was a few down, the contacts that SQLite. So what this contacts, it lists all their contact IDs and their current status message, and if there's a picture associated to that contact. So then if you wanted to see the picture, you have to go a step further and manually go out to that media location, the profile, and look for that ID number, and you would see that. Um, here, this is exactly what we're doing. We're going to media, and I mentioned at the beginning of this presentation that some of the applications will store data in the media folder, and this is exactly what's happening with WhatsApp. So you can see each of them here, and the photos and the associated, and you just have to match up the numbers, and you'll see the JPEG. The profile picture you can see is listed here as well. So this is three different locations on where WhatsApp is storing its data, and the tool is only pulling one. And the tool claims to do a good job at it, and it truly does. It just does not get it all. So again, you have to be smarter than your tool, smarter than the smartphone, and dive deeper and get this data. And I know I just ran at like crazy pace at the end there to finish on time, so I apologize. Any questions? I'm out of breath. I feel like I was talking so quickly. <laughs> it's a lot of material to go over quickly. So, when, so you're going to be running this at Sandsfire, right? Um, I actually do next week at SecWest. Okay. And then the um, summit in Austin, and then Sandsfire. So three times in the next month, really. So you're busy yes. then? Yes, and then Cindy's running it two times in the summer um, at Boston and San Francisco. I believe Chris Crowley is running it in Australia in July. Very cool. Now, do you see the open source tools finally getting better, or do you see that the open source tools are still fundamentally lagging behind a lot of the commercial tools? Because I know that you rely heavily on the commercial tools in class, but there's some you know, open source tools that are smattered in. Do you see them trying to catch up with the commercial tools, or do you see them just kind of stagnating? Um, so I'll use Altopsy as a perfect example because I work for Basis and Brian Carrier is my boss. Um, his issue with Altopsy, I keep driving him, I'm like, make Altopsy do this, make it do this, but how do you keep up with the commercial vendors and all the funding to get the engineers or people to commit their time to do this? It's difficult. So it's one of those, even if his point of view is, even if he gets Altopsy to do all the parsing, they're probably still using a commercial tool to do the dump. So would they still use open source to analyze it? So I think that's where everyone falls is what's the point? But I will say there are tools that do a really good job. And the backup ones that I mentioned earlier, iExplorer, iBackupBot, 
did fantastic, did just as well as physical analyzer, which saves you about $10,000. And it depends on the device. Oh, very cool. Well, thank you for coming and hanging out with the Security Weekly family uh, today. We'd love to have you back uh, if you have anything else you'd like to add in the future because I know smartphone forensics, mobile forensics in, in general. And it's funny because a lot of what you're talking about isn't just from mobile devices if, you know, like phones, but also getting into tablets and things of that nature. I can only see mm -hmm. this, this topic getting more and more interesting and difficult for security professionals to navigate moving forward in the future. But thanks again for attending and can't wait to have you on again sometime in the future. Thanks thank so you. much, Heather. All right, everybody. Well, that concludes this session. I, sorry, John. I, go I got to go. My, my phone's ringing. <laughs> Danger zone. But I got I got to answer that. Hang on. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you guys in a couple of weeks. The next one, we'll be talking about hunt teaming. Paul, this should be a pretty interesting one. We're having Seth Meisner and Eric Conrad come on and talk about uh, making an assumption that your network is already compromised. Your IDS, IPS, firewall, AV has failed, and uh, you're dealing with more advanced attackers. How do you actually detect those types of attacks? So that should be a great session. So until then, thank you so much, and we'll see you then. Thanks, everyone.